Well, hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Pardon me? Is that good? Okay, good. He's doing the AV thing here, so we'll get started in just a moment. Um, why don't we just open in prayer real quick? How's that sound? I've taught a lot of people in, cl- in churches all throughout Northern Virginia, D.C. area, m- Bible-based money management, and we're going to try and do a little bit of that here today with a couple little twists. So let's uh, just go to the Lord first and give him some praise and honor. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this gathering today, Lord. We just pray, Lord, that your will is done for all of us today, that anything we're learning today we can take back and understand how to use the assets that you've given us in man's tools for your glory and honor, that that we will understand the purpose of your role and our role being good stewards. In Jesus' name, Lord, we pray. Amen. So, um, uh, well, thank you for having me today. And just real quick, I I do own a a wealth management firm called Rosenthal Wealth Management Group. And we have an office, a couple of offices in around the D.C. area in Northern Virginia. I uh, host a radio show on uh, Saturday mornings called Making Money Sense. I've been doing that for quite a while. It's a live, biblically-based financial planning uh, talk show. I just got off the air this morning and, and ran down here real quick. Glad I made it on time. So that's a good thing. Uh, I also... Uh, go on Fox Business and CNBC uh, pretty regularly on national TV and one of those little heads up in the corner yelling and screaming about Wall Street and all that kind of stuff. So I fly around the country and, and uh, t- teach other financial advisors about financial planning. So I do some national speaking as well. And the reason I say this real quick is because I'm often up in front of groups like this and I get a lot of questions. So I would encourage you to ask questions on anything at all the, the, uh, on some of the subject matter that we uh, are going to go over today. We're here for all of us to learn, and hopefully we'll come away with some, some good information. And I want to take a look at, at how we have to sort of understand things when we look at our assets from a spiritual point of view. You know, what, what does the Bible say about money? It's not working here. What does the Bible say about our goods and our resources? You know, we've, we've got the bank accounts, we've got the, the hot cars, the house, church on Sunday, and our money. And how does all this stuff wrap together? Because it, we get confused a lot, you know. We, we, we talk about good stewardship, but we have to understand how to use these assets, right? So the Bible also talks about money and different things with it. It talks about giving how much should we give? Who should we give to? Why should we give? You know, the Lord likes to give a cheerful giver, right? Not a reluctant one. What about money as it relates to our possessions? What's the Bible say about that? How about work and the dangers of money? Lots of scripture in the Bible about money. As a matter of fact, the Bible mentions prayer 500 times, faith 491 times, and money 2,330 times throughout the Bible. Isn't that amazing? When I, when I first learned this several years ago, I was like, wow, that's, that's kind of interesting, to me anyway. So how do the last few slides apply to all of us as we go back to our congregations, as well as back in our real life, and talking to our coworkers at work? How does it all apply to us? People are watching us all the time, aren't they? Okay. People are always watching, well, how do you react? What goes on? You know, maybe you're talking to a friend and you're slowly witnessing to them over time and something happens in your life or something happens with your money or whatever. How do you react? They're looking at us, aren't they? They are. They want to see that calm, cool, you know, they want to see the fruits of the Spirit inside of us being demonstrated outward. And so here we have these issues with money. And let's break it down a little bit and hopefully get some education on it. We have God's economy over here on one side. We have man's economy on the other. Because if you stop and think about it for a moment, God gives us the ability to go to work. He gives us the ability to do things, to earn a living, right? And, and he gives us the ability to make money, buy a house, buy a car. And we need to be good stewards with his assets, right? But we also have to understand 
how to use those assets in man's economy. You know, man-made mutual funds, man-made 401k plans, man-made CDs at the bank, right? So we have to understand how to use the possessions the Lord has given us in man's tools. Does that make sense? So that's what we're going to try and learn today a little bit like that. So over here in God's economy, the soul of one person is worth more than all the wealth in the world. We know this. We know these scriptures. God owns what? Everything. Case closed, right? Case closed. So if we get into this here, some have more talents in different areas. Some have ability. Some have more worldly wealth. I did not get my fair dose of the ability to sing. I'll tell you that right now. Okay, uh, I sing all the time, um, <laughs> and I play the guitar a little bit. But my family says, "Dad, you know, maybe we'll sing for you a little bit." Okay, so so somebody has more talent than, than I do in that area, and that's okay. That's what help, helps make the world go round a little bit. God is pleased with good stewardship when it comes to our possessions, right? I often get asked in, in the line of work that I do, I meet with, with clients locally and all over the country, financial planning, investment strategies, trust work, stocks, options, just the whole nine yards, just, just the whole everything. And I always get the question, every, well, not always, but every once in a while somebody asks me the question, you know, how do we get financial freedom? And, and my answer is so simple, a lot of times it just, it just blows your mind. And it's like, give it away. Give the ownership and the control that you desire for that away. Give it to the Lord. Right? Here's God. Here we are. He doesn't want anything in between us, does he? But yet we get wrapped up in this money thing all the time. We have to save for, you know, we have families to provide for mortgages to make, car payments to make, kids to put through college, right? We drive down the street and our friends come up with a brand new car and we're going, wow, oh, it looks nice, doesn't it? Where's my new car, right? Okay? We get pulled back. There's a lot of confusion in man's economy. We can't have trust in worldly things, can we? But yet, back a couple of slides ago, prestige at the job, prestige in, in, you know, worldly things. It's not really the way it works. So here we have it. We have, we sit over here and we, we want to maintain ourselves in, man, in God's economy all the time on this side of the stage. But we get pulled back across into God's, into man's economy over here. We get our paycheck. We have to put money away. We have to save. How do these two things intersect? So that's what we're going to try and talk about today as you go back to your churches. Be thinking about this, how we can teach people how to sort of manage their assets and looking at the difference between man and God's economy a little bit. Oh, another thing, we live in a throwaway society. I got that phrase from Paul Newman before he passed. I didn't know the guy. I just heard him say it one day. Uh, here's this wealthy man. I was just taken back by... He was talking about um, how he was trying to fix his toaster one day. I don't remember the story too well. It was a long time ago. But, but you know, here's this, this Hollywood icon for years. We all know who Paul Newman was or is, right? And, and he's got this probably $25 toaster that he's had for years, and it wouldn't pop up or something. So he's taking the whole thing apart and getting the spring reloaded or whatever it is he's doing to it. And they're like, well, why? And he's like, because we live in a throwaway society. I can just spend 15 minutes and fix it. I don't have to throw it away and go buy a new one, right? And stop and think about that. So many people are out trying to get the new big screen TV because it's got a brand new blue button on it this year. Last year's model worked okay, didn't it? Okay. So let's sort of set the stage and take a look at some attitudes that we have going on. Because you say I am rich, this is in Revelation 3.17, and I've become wealthy, and have the need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. People put a lot of trust and faith and prestige and confidence and security in what? In things that aren't heavenly, right? But in assets. Correct? We do. 
And I know that we always think to ourselves, man, if I could just figure out how to get that extra amount of money in my bank account, I'll be okay, right? That's a tough thing not to think about because we want to produce and provide for our families and our heirs, but we can't get so caught up in that that becomes our mission, right? Our mission needs to be to serve the Lord with the assets that he's given us. Fair enough? Um, for the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. It's not the root of evil, but it is a root of all sorts of evil. And some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. No one can serve two masters. Either he's going to hate one and love the other. You cannot serve both God and money. We know these things, but then all of a sudden... We're sitting over here and we're trying to figure out well, which mutual fund do we invest in in our retirement plan, right? So we need to have education on man's tools and understand how to apply them in God's economy. That's what I want to talk about today, all right? So let's go on and look at some more scripture here. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves what? Treasures in heaven where neither moth and rust can destroy, where thieves don't break in and steal. Fair enough. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Again, here's the Lord. Here we are. He wants nothing between us, right? Think about the Israelites every day getting man manna. You know, I have a conversation with a friend of mine in Bible class about this all the time. Every day, they got the manna, right? Don't save any for tomorrow, because tomorrow I'm going to give you brand new, right? Okay? Think about that. Just the, just the ability for us to let go and have the 24-7 constant reliability, trust, faith, and dependence on the Lord for everything. Are we bold enough to live that way? That's a hard thing, isn't it? It is, because we plan. But plans are good. We should lay our plans up to the Lord, right? And ask for his will to be done. So let's move forward with it a little bit here. And Timothy, but those that want to get rich fall in temptation and a snare. And many foolish and harmful, des harmful desires plunge people into ruin. Ecclesiastes 11.2. Boy, you talk about diversification and asset allocation and risk reduction strategies right out of the Bible. Here it is. In my world, divide your portion to seven or even eight, for you do not know what misfortune may occur on earth. That speaks volumes to me and what I do every day. Remember, Grandma said, don't put all your eggs in one basket, right? Talking about investing. So we'll get into some of that in a little while. Let's move forward here a little bit. Render what is due to them, taxes. Tax, pay, you know, render unto Caesar and render unto the Lord. We know these scriptures. We have, to, we have to follow the authority. We have to follow the rules. We've got these assets coming to us. We purchase assets. We have homes, again. We have desires to improve socioeconomic standards of living within our family. We have to deal with, should I have a will or a trust? Well, what type of trust should I have? I was talking about estate taxes and trust planning this morning on, the, on my radio show a little bit. Where does all this stuff come? We've got to start with the basics, some basic understanding of it all. He who is faithful in very little thing is also faithful in much, and he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. When, when Paul asked me to, to come speak today, I was very flattered and, and, and very glad I'm here, by the way. We were talking about, you know, God in the workplace. How do we put God into the workplace? And, and this scripture here speaks volumes to me about that. When we look at people in the workplace, and, and a little story, you know, you, you walk into your, your workplace or, or people in your congregations go into their workplace, and as soon as they enter, they sort of know, if you will, the pecking order of things. They walk down the hallway, and, you know, they know that they're on the same level with this group here, or maybe this is their su uh, supervisor group over here, or maybe their subordinates over here. They know all that instantly as they walk in. My point is that as we go through the day, people are watching and they see how we react and what we do with 
little tiny things with things that nobody knows about. You know, the orchestra leader up here doesn't know that I could replug his stuff, right? I mean, you know, think about it. But uh, it, it's just constantly leading that, that godly life every single day. Um, kind of kind of trying to bend the story into just do the right thing all the time, pretty much. And we, we all know this, but it speaks volumes in a lot of places. Giving, um, for the earth is the Lord and all that it contains in 1 Corinthians 10, 26. 1 Timothy, instruct those that are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on uncertainty or riches but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to be good. Be good in good works. Be generous and ready to share, storing up for ourselves treasures of a good foundation for the future so that they will take hold of what life is indeed. That goes across everything in the workplace. It really does. Not only that, but it also goes across how we should manage our assets, and we'll get into some of this. Estate planning, you know. Riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. Man's economy, back on this side of the screen, and God's economy. Man's economy basically says, he or she who dies with the most toys wins. That's not what the Lord's economy says over on this side of the screen, is it? Not at all. We want to live over here. We've got to look at man's economy, man's tools, and figure out how to make things work, right? It's about the tale of the talents, you know? Jesus rewarded the person who returned the most. Debt. <laughs> Just stay out of debt. <laughs> That's kind of an easy thing to do. However, our economy, our society has done a wonderful job in training people that the big screen television is not $3,000, it's only $39.95 a month, okay? We cannot look at things like that. We, we cannot look at things like that at all, okay? We need to really stop and understand how to budget our, our items. And let me, as long as I'm talking about budget and debt real quick, let me tell you the reality with that. There's two realities here. First reality is never buy a book or CD or go to a seminar on budgeting. The only person that's going to make money is the person selling the book. Okay? Seriously. And there's, there's, there's just two columns that you have to look at. I tell people this all the time, and it's so simple, but if you do this, it works. And please share this with people as you go walk through your day. You just list out, there's three columns, I'm sorry. You just list out your items that you spend money on. I don't know, the last four months. Mortgage, food, food in the house, food out of the house, fuel, clothing, everywhere you spend money. And then you come over to this side of the table, or, or paper, and you make two columns. One that says necessity, one that says lifestyle choice. And you put check marks right down both of them, okay? And then pray about it a little bit. Some people are going to say, absolutely not, Larry. Cable TV is a necessity. I don't care what anybody says. And other people are going to say, no, that's a lifestyle choice. But if you do that simple budget exercise and money's tight, you'll find that you can look down that column of lifestyle choice, and you don't have to stop it. But what you have the ability to do is to, listen up, temporarily suspend some of those activities. Okay? Just temporarily suspend some of those activities and move that suspended money over into the bank or to retire some debt. That is the most simplest, most effective way to budget to reduce debt and start moving the ledger into the savings account. Okay? tell people that all the time. And, and it works. I see people do that. It's very simple. Okay? And there's no right or wrong. If you think cable TV is a necessity and another person thinks it's a lifestyle choice, it doesn't matter. It's what you think. But you're going to go through the lifestyle side and temporarily suspend some things from time to time. Okay. Um, so 
given the background here on, on the difference between man's economy and God's economy, I was asking Paul, I said, you know, well, what should I talk about on money management? Should I just do something that's very specific and detailed? Or should I do something that sort of covers the bell curve of knowledge? In other words, there's probably people in here that, that, that aren't too familiar how a basic CD really works in the bank. And there's probably people in here that might not understand how their mutual funds work. And there's probably people in here that have sophisticated estate planning, life insurance policies, you know, stock options, the whole nine yards. So she said, well, why don't you come in and talk a little bit about just some of the basics. So what I want to do is sort of teach you how to understand what's going on in the economy and then teach you some basics in investment management, some of the tools, mutual funds, ETFs, things like that. Fair enough? Any questions so far on anything? So we have the Lord's economy here. He blesses us with this, with his assets. And now we've got to put it over here in all this Wall Street stuff. Okay? So let's just take a look at it real quick. First of all, here's something that just demystifies everybody all the time whenever I say this. The economy only does two things. It either is in an expansion mode or a contraction mode. That's it. So when you hear people on TV yelling and screaming about the economy and the Federal Reserve and blah, 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 just remember. It's only either expanding or contracting. That's all it can do, okay? That's all it can do. Right now, it's in a slow economic expansion mode, and I can give you a bunch of speak on it all, but it's slowly expanding. So we, as investors, need to look at two different sides of the house, fiscal policy and monetary policy. We've all heard of the Federal Reserve raising and lowering interest rates you know, the TARP programs, the bond buying programs, quantitative easing, all this Fed speak, that's all over here on monetary policy. Fiscal is what comes out of the White House and Congress, kind of tax and spend policy regulation. That's all we need to know. Basically, the Federal Reserve controls the monetary policy here. And they have two mandates, maximum employment and price stability, and both of those fight against each other. That's the great debate. Should they raise interest rates? How much? When? How often? They're going to probably raise in December a quarter point. So last December, it was at zero. They raised it to 0.25 of a percent, right? CD people were going, well, it's not quite five yet, and it won't be for a long time. Interest rates are going to be very, very low in the banks for many more years to come, okay? That's just the deal right there. So the impact on investment decisions in the economy. There's a website I'm going to put up here. And if you go read these reports right here, if you literally spend an hour a day, now who would want to read that stuff, Larry? No, I do. I like it, okay? I read it all the time. But a lot of people say, hey, I want to get knowledge. How do you understand what's happening in the economy? Where do you go to find out this stuff? So the, the, the closer you are to the source, the more truth there is in accuracy, right? Just in the Bible, the more familiar we are with the Lord's Word written on our heart, when we go out walking in the day and we hear somebody say, something that's just not right, we know about it, right? So the more accurate when it comes to understanding all these reports that come out all month long, if we understood them, and then we heard somebody saying, well, that's you know, not right, we go, no, I just read that. I know what it means. I know what it is. That's my point there. So all these reports come out, consumer price index, international trade, retail sales, all this stuff. The economy just constantly is moving, either in an expansion mode or contraction mode, right? And these reports can come out. Maybe domestic product came out. GDP came out yesterday, 2.9%. It, it was the most growth we've had in the last eight quarters. Very, very good. It may push the economy in a different direction of expansion. 
So one report doesn't tell you everything that's going on, but all these reports together will. And if you, code, if you want to understand and read these, getting back to what I said a moment ago, if we were to read these reports for maybe an hour a day for three or four months, which just sounds like going to the dentist would be a lot more fun anyway, okay? You go to the NASDAQ website and they're all there. You go to the NASDAQ website, click on News, and click on Economic Calendar. All of these reports are there, and this is the starting point. This is the truth of what's happening in the economy, all the economic numbers. So you can educate yourself and see what's happening in the marketplace. All this stuff's going to impact taxes, interest rates, housing prices, fuel prices, clothing prices, food prices, all of that. Is. So people often ask, you know, when is the next crash coming? I had a radio caller on my show this morning saying that she was up reading the internet this morning. I'm thinking, oh no, okay. <laughs> she was reading the internet this morning and somebody was saying on the internet today that any day now we're getting get, going to get ready for the next major crash. She wanted to know my opinion. And you know, the market will have pullbacks from time to time. But let me show you a slide that's going to give you such great insight into expansion and contraction. Usually when the economy is expanding, the markets go up, correct? When the economy contracts, the markets go down. Now the markets will go up and pull back and up and pull back until we have contraction and it just goes down, down, down. So here we have the interest rates from 1950 on. The gray bars are recessions. The white areas are economic expansions. So the gray bars are contractions. The white areas are expansions. Pretty simple, right? So let's just take a look here. We have an expansion. When the economy is expanding, interest rates go up. So let's look at some logical things here, practicality. If I wanted to go buy a brand new car today and finance it, at 2.5% interest, it's a lot easier for me to do it at 2.5% versus 5% interest, isn't it? Okay. But now at the same time, if I were to take a dollar into the grocery store and buy a loaf of bread, I'd get 15 slices of bread. At least my kind of bread anyway, right? Okay. So this time next year, if I took that same dollar into the grocery store, but I only got 11 slices of bread, I've actually lost purchasing power with my dollar, right? That's not good. But if the economy's expanding and jobs are plentiful and everybody's getting raises all the time, what do we do? We go out and spend more money. And that causes inflation. The prices of goods and services to rise. So when that happens in an expansion period right here, the Federal Reserve raises interest rates to slow down the economy a little bit. And they raise rates to a point where the economy rolls over into a recession, and then they drop interest rates again. And then they, we start to expand again, a new cycle, and they, what do they do? They raise rates again. Until when? The economy overheats and pulls back, and we go into a recession again. Then they stimulate by lowering interest rates. Because when interest rates are up here, I've got to finance a car at 5% when they're down here at 25 So more capital is moving in the economy, in the system. And then we have an expansion again. Do you see a pattern here? Absolutely. Where are rates today? Rates today are pretty low, aren't they? What's interesting to me about this chart is when we take a look from trough to peak, trough to peak, trough to peak. And I'm up here pointing because this laser thing's not working. So I apologize for that. Oh, well, maybe, can you see that dot? You have a better one? Press this button. Ooh, that's a better one. Yeah, all right, thank you. <laughs> okay, so from, from trough to peak, 
trough to peak, trough to peak, trough, we've got a ways to go for rates to come up before we roll over into another recession, don't we? This was the chart I was thinking in my mind when the lady called my radio show this morning after she read on the internet last, earlier today, we're going to crash. Now the market will pull back from time to time, but remember the economy either is expanding or contracting. It's in expansion mode now. Makes it pretty simple, doesn't it? Okay. So let's take a look here now at some investments. And I want to give you some high-level understanding of how investments work. Because as I mentioned, Paula said, well, let's just do some basic stuff because we don't know what everybody knows in the, in the group. So some of you, parts of this will be new. Some of you, parts of this will be boring. And some of you will, will, will raise it up and, and confuse you thoroughly there anyway. How's that sound? I'll start talking Wall Street to you. So why do people want to invest? Retirement, want to buy a new home, other goals, college funding. Why do you want to invest? Why are you saving money? What's going on? Think about that. So there's five myths and truths of investing. And let's go examine some of them. Myth number one, recessions in bear markets prove that stocks aren't worth the risk. Over the long haul, stocks have historically outperformed all other investing asset classes. So let's take a look here at how a stock works. A lot of people don't understand how stocks work. Oops. By purchasing a stock, you actually purchase an ownership in a corporation. Okay? Stock is referred to as an equity position. You have an ownership. So if we bought one share of, of Apple stock, we can go to their meeting each year. We can stand in the back and ask questions. Hey, I'm an owner. I got a share, right? OK? You can do that kind of stuff. So investors are going to buy a share of stock. When you buy a share of stock right now, if we went and bought a share of Apple stock, does that help out the company? Does that give the company money? No, it does not. OK? Because we're not buying it directly from Apple. If we were buying it directly from Apple, then we would be giving Apple directly the money. They would give us this stock certificate. But if we decided tomorrow or Monday to go buy a share of Apple stock, we're buying it from somebody who wants to sell their share. OK? So it doesn't help the company. Sure, if the price moves up, the company's more valuable, but that's another story, OK? But one of the main purposes, as we'll see here in a little bit, we want to divide investments up between ownership and loanership dollars. Ownership is in stock, and that tends to outpace taxes and inflation over a long period of time. And one of the key things that we have to do as investors is outpace taxes and inflation and investment fees because that's the bottom line dollar net that you and I can go into the store and buy goods and services with. Fair enough? So here's a look at the historical performance of stocks from 1996 to 2015. If we had put, oh, that's too dark right there, but if we had put $10,000 into the market back in 96, today it would have been worth $48,000 at the end of, of 2015. So what's interesting about this story, though, is this. If we decided to put the $10,000 in in 1996 and then took a nap and woke up at the end of 2015 and somebody said, well, your ten grand is worth forty-eight, we we'd go, ha-ha, that's great, right? But where we get involved is these emotional decisions when it's going up and down, right, all the time. See that? See these pullbacks? So our eye automatically gravitates to this slide from here to here, from here to here, doesn't it? But what our eye misses is the story of this pullback from here to here, 
here to here, here to here, here to here, here to here. Big one. Here to here, here to here. There's a good chance that we were involved in an economic expansion right here with temporary pullbacks because of a geopolitical issue or a war or something like that. These are tremendous buying opportunities right here, these little dips. Okay? But over the long haul, stocks tend to outproduce. Well, Larry, I'm 67 years old. I don't, you know, I, I don't need the long haul. No, you do. Because you need money when you're 77, 87, and now 97. But you need to have some money in cash, bonds, and stocks. It needs to be diversified. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So stockholders, what are the risks when you buy a stock? Now, you can have a mutual fund that's filled with stocks, or an ETF that's filled with stocks, and I'll explain some of that in a little while. But one of the things we have is market risk. What's that? Well, market risk is pretty simple. It's this, the market going up and down. The market going up here and then down right there. The market sits up here and then drops right there for maybe eight months or so. And we go, I can't take this, I don't want to do this, and I sell out of it. And where do we buy again? We buy when it's back up here, when it's safe, right? We do. We buy when it's safe, when the markets are high. We shouldn't do that. We have economic risk. If the economy is, what does the economy do? Expands or contracts, that's it, right? If the economy is expanding, it's time to probably be there. If the economy is contracting, it's time to pull back and get defensive. Fair enough? Okay. We also have specific company risk. We decide to invest in, we can invest in two companies today, Apple Computer or <laughs> Samsung. There you go. <laughs> I was going to say uh, Larry Shoe Manufacturing Company that I'm going to go start this afternoon, right? But, but there you go. You can, if you invest in a company, then that investment you're making by buying that stock is going to, you, you have single company risk. That's why, in some cases, that's okay for people, in others, it's not. But that's why they have packaged products, mutual funds, and ETFs, and such things as that as well. Oop, I advanced the slide, there we go. So over time, if you take a look here over time, the chance of gain in a one year period, a five year period, or a 10 year period, if you were to put money in the market, whether it's a mutual fund or an individual stock or an ETF product, and you said, I want to hold this for 10 years, you have a 93.5% chance of a positive return. That is cool, isn't it? But yet at the same time, the average investor ends up with a 2 or 3% rate of return. Why is that? It's perplexing to me, but here's the reason. I'm going to back up. Because during these little dips right here, they sell out. Can't take the emotion this month, and they sell out. Okay. So, over a five-year rolling period, 86% chance, and over a one-year period, 82.5% chance. Now, this is from 76 through 2015 in the S&P 500. Fact and indisputable. It's time in the market. And when I talk about the market, people get worried, oh, there's risk and all that. There is risk. There's also risk of not investing, too, because you'll lose purchasing power. You won't be able to maintain inflation costs because your money's not growing, right? So we can go down, get on the television, and start talking about you know, the relative P.E. ratio to the dividend spread over the 10-year treasury. How's it gapping right now? What's the TED spread look like internationally? How about the Fed minutes and all that kind of stuff? Or we can break things down very simple like this, exactly. Or we can break things down very simple like this and just say what we need to do is we need to be a good steward with our assets and get some education on how things really work. Fair enough? Yes, ma'am. What do I think about fixed indexed annuities? For old people. I just had a birthday, so I'm feeling old, okay? All right. 
So um, every single product has a pro and con to it. There's advantages of an individual stock and disadvantages. There's an advantage of a mutual fund and disadvantages. There's an advantage of an indexed annuity and a disadvantage of the indexed annuity. There's three types of annuities, fixed, variable, and indexed annuity. So each annuity is going to bring to the table tax deferral for you and the ability never to outlive your income. That's the chassis of an annuity. But this company says, in addition to that, I'm going to have a special feature added on. This company says, in addition to that chassis, I'm going to have a different special, special feature added on. So the key is finding an annuity, whether it's fixed, indexed, or variable, with the special fe features or riders that work for you and your family. Some of them have enhanced long-term care income. Some of them have enhanced death benefits. Some of them have enhanced guaranteed growth. Some of them have enhanced guaranteed income. So you have to take a look at the different riders or the different things you can add. If we were to go to lunch today, and we'll all go to lunch and we all eat food, right? But I'm going to eat a cheeseburger, you're going to eat a salad. But we both ate food, fair enough? That's how you have to look at the annuity world. So every single product I attack that way. What's the advantage of it and how does it fit specifically to you? So I'm not going to say I love them or I hate them because I know that they have these little riders that can be added on to them. So we need to give you the education on what all the riders can do and the cost. And then you can make the decision on which indexed annuity with what writer will work for you. Does that make sense? So I wasn't going to give you an answer. It's kind of a long-winded answer, but that's the right answer rather than just saying, oh, I love them or I hate them. And then somebody else goes, oh, well, we all got to go buy those. I, I can't do that. So it, it drills down into what your needs are. So good question. Um, so bonds are for conservative investors. Bonds can play a crucial role in any portfolio. Okay? Uh, so myth number two, bonds are for conservative investors. Well, there's some truth to that. There's some truth to all this stuff, but it is a myth. And it can be for growth investors also. So if you stop and think about the market going up and going down, right? So the average return in the market the Dow Jones from 1926 through 2015 is 10.02%. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? I'd sign up for that right now. 10.02%? Absolutely. However, in examining that 10.02%, let's just round it and call it 10% so I can do math easy since I'm a financial planner. How's that sound? So if I have something that earns 20% and something that earns zero, my average is 10, right? Fair enough. But now let's ask the question, how many times since 1926 has the market returned a rate of return 10% or more higher than the average or 10% or more lower than the average? So the average is 10. What percent of the time has the market returned zero or less or 20 or more? 63% of the time. 63% of the time, the market returns plus 10% higher than the average or minus 10% lower than the average. How many times has the market returned between 8 and 12 percent. The average is 10 since 1926. So how many times has the market returned between, 12, uh, between 8 and 12 percent? Five times. Five times. What does that tell us? You can't trust averages. Well, these are the averages that I'm giving you. Correct. I'm trying to extract that. Gentleman says averages alone don't tell the whole story. That's right. And I'm trying to extract that and apply it to why we need to have some bonds. 
Because we live in a market of extremes. The market is here. The market is here. Here's that average or mean, right? So what bonds do for us, you and I as investors, is it sort of chops off the top and chops off the bottom and keeps us a little bit tighter. Make sense? Gives us less upness and less downness for a technical term there, okay? It's called upside and downside capture or standard deviation. But anyway, it gives us the ability to chop off some of the bottom and chop off some of the top. So bonds play a role. The primary investment objective of bonds is current income. Growth is secondary. The primary investment objective of stocks is growth. Income is secondary. We have different types of bonds, and I'm not going to get into the different types. Okay, We could be here all day do, doing, doing that. But here's the historical performance of bonds. And you can see that they go up for a while right here. Okay. Corporate bonds, treasuries, looks like, looks like my fonts aren't uh, coming through in the right colors, but, you know, in the S&P 500. So, so look at the bonds right here, sort of a steady eddy type of performance ride, if you will, and then look at the stock market right here. See that? So then if we were to take a combination of both of the bonds down here, and the stocks, we might have a line that moves a little bit like this. Make sense? Okay. So which one's right? You determine that. What kind of ride do you want to go on? Right? You determine that. So bonds have different risk, default risk, credit risk, market risk, interest rate risk. There's all different things like that. One of the big issues right now is interest rate risk. And that is, if the Federal Reserve raises rates, rates, interest rates go up, bond prices go down. So we're officially in a rate rising cycle right now. So some bonds will be going down. On the other hand, some bonds will rise because they're credit sensitive. So no matter, my point is with that statement, no matter what type of policy comes out of Washington, there's always places to move away from and places to move to with your money. That's why I put up those slides on understanding the economy, tax and spend, Fed, monetary policy, that type of stuff to read it. Or work with a financial advisor on it all. This just shows if interest rates go down, bond prices go up. If interest rates go up, bond prices go down. I'm going to speed up a little bit here just because of time. Okay. Um, if you invest for the long haul, you have nothing to worry about. That's a myth. Even long-term investors consider inflation and taxes. So I, I gave you the example of a loaf of bread a little while ago. It is so important for us to outpace taxes and inflation. right? So here we are. We've got some money. We're going to put it away. Because we, we take a look here at basic TV cable, uh, $75 a month. Now, who's going to pay $75 a month? I don't think mine runs that, okay? <laughs> um, in 10 years, 133. But, you know, inflation on cable TV is going up almost 6%, 5.9%. But yet, you know what inflation is right now in the overall economy? 1.2. They announced the other day Social Security, anybody taking Social Security payments, retired taking Social Security payments? They announced the other day that Social Security is getting a raise next year. Very nice. It's 0.3%. That's it. 0.3% is what the raise is in Social Security next year. But stop and think about this, though. Since 1975, Social Security has only not had a raise three times. 2010, 11, and 16. All the other times it's had a raise. We have to make sure our money's outpacing taxes and inflation. Okay? We have to. So now we get into some taxes. The top 25% of taxpayers pay 86% of federal income taxes. We figure out what our investment rate of return is, 8%, minus our tax rate. We end up with a net of 6. And then we have to put in inflation. Okay. Um, this just shows here growing our money tax deferred. 
I have a lot more slides here, but I want to be aware of your time because I'm the only one standing between y'all and lunch. <laughs> okay. Um, point is that the tax code gives us opportunities in retirement plans, or you mentioned an annuity, to have tax deferred growth, and those things are great, and we need to explore and exploit those opportunities. We need to build a financial plan and stay with it, work with an advisor, or learn how to do it yourself. We've got to plan these assets. And you know what's interesting right now? I want you to stop for a moment and, and think about this question real quick to yourself. For the last 30 minutes or so, we've been talking about stocks and stock market and money and growing wealth and all that kind of stuff, right? Do you see how easy it is to get sucked over into man's economy? Right? Let's go back over here on God's side of the ledger real quick in God's economy. What does God say about this? He says get some education on things, doesn't he? Right? Okay. Pardon me? Yes. We need some education. That's correct. So, I, you know, that's, that's one of my main points today is some of the slides that I gave you there, or you can, you can call my office and I'll give you the web links to go read this stuff or work with an advisor. I know you all are from all over the place. If you wanted to, I'd be happy to come out to, to some of your churches and, and have a much more lengthy discussion for your congregations and things and teach them. I'm fine with that. Um, any questions so far? I just want to be aware of time here. We, we're doing okay? All right. Well, I'll keep talking. Then. You guys all right? Okay, we'll keep going. So individual retirement accounts, 25% of people have them, and uh, at least 16% of people own an, a Roth IRA. We, we, we have to make sure that we're putting money away for short-term and long-term. When you're looking to invest money, ask yourself, putting the money in, what's my tax treatment? While the money's in there growing, what's the tax treatment while it's growing? And then pulling the money out, what's the tax treatment? And then passing the assets on to a non-spousal beneficiary, what's the, the tax treatment? Yes, sir. There's a non-deductible IRA. So a, a Roth IRA enables one to put after-tax money in, money that's in your wallet right now. You can put it into a Roth IRA if your income is under a certain level. The money goes in, and then while it's in there growing, there's no taxes. And when you pull it out, there's no taxes, the principal and interest earnings. As long as it stays in there for five years or to 59 and a half, whichever is longer. A non-deductible IRA is money that's in your wallet now, so it's after tax. You put it in. While it's in there, there's no taxes while it's growing. However, when you pull it out, you pay taxes on the interest earnings. Okay? Only. The principal always comes out tax free because it's already been taxed. So that's the difference between the two. And then a deductible IRA is everything you put in is tax deductible. So if you have 50000 of income and you put 5000 in, you're only paying taxes on 45000 of income that year. And then while that one right here is inside the account, there's no taxes while it's growing. Then when you pull it out, it's fully taxable to you. Okay? So if I marched 100 financial advisors in from around the country right now, the first third are going to tell you, always put your money into the deductible one. You want the tax deduction today. The second third is going to say, no, 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 don't do that at all. Always put it in the Roth. Because taxes are going to go way up in the future. I'm in the third camp. I like a combination of both. 
okay? I recognize the importance and the power of a tax deduction today for putting money in your retirement plans. And I also recognize the power of tax-free income in retirement years because I have so many clients that have put the majority of their money in their retirement plans at work and now they're having to pay lots of taxes in retirement. So I like a combination of both, tax allocation strategy. So we need asset allocation, put our money in large company stocks, small company, international, bonds, product allocation, annuities, ETFs, stocks, ETNs, mutual funds, UITs, and then we need tax allocation strategy. All that stuff wraps around into producing a group of investment accounts or your portfolio that's efficient to a risk return relationship. That's the secret that we have to look at. And then monitor that as time goes on, as the markets grow, as the economy expands and things of that nature. Okay? So I have lots more slides, but I'm gonna go ahead and, and, and stop right here just to be respectful of the rest of your your uh, time today at the conference. Um, yes, ma'am. Did you put it back in when it was up again? It was down. You can't keep doing that. You'll lose. You can't time the market. That's remarkable that you were able to do that, and I commend you for it. Um, but if you keep on trying to do that, it won't work. I've never seen anybody do it. Matter of fact, there's all kinds of surveys and, and studies out there of day traders and people moving in and out and stuff, and they make money like 1.6% of the time or something like that. It's very, I mean, it's like go to Vegas then, you know. So getting back to your question on what's, well, I think tithing is, is important. I can't address your question as to what percentage of my clients that are Christians that tithe remain financially strong. I mean, a lot of our clients are financially strong simply because they tithe, but they also know who owns the money and that they're, the money that they have, the assets that they have is not them. They're using it to provide for their families and to further the kingdom, you know, the Lord's work and stuff. So, you know, the Lord's pretty clear in the Bible. It says, test me on this one, you know. Send some money into my storehouse and see what happens. You know, to some, he's going he's gonna to give a lot more, but I think a lot of it goes to your heart, too. I, I really do. And, you know, speaking of knowing the times, I mean, the headlines are just filled with turmoil and rumors and lies and all that stuff. And everybody's asking, a lot of people are asking me, you know, is the U.S. going to fall? Is the dollar going to collapse? All that kind of stuff. And I tell you this, I look at it a little differently. I think pieces are falling in place rather than falling apart. I think pieces are falling in place for the Lord's return, whether it's next Tuesday or 300 years from now, okay? But if the whole economy falls apart and your money's worthless, does it really matter? I got no money. You got no money. You know? Think about it. We need to stay on the Jesus ship and don't reach for the wheel is what we need to do. Okay? That's what we need to do. Any other questions on anything? 
Pardon me? Yes. Um, it, it really hasn't. Um, when we talk about velocity of money, the question is velocity of money as it turned the corner and started going back up. You look at retail sales, they're stagnant. Okay, so from that standpoint, no. But you look at output, yes. You look at housing starts, yes. All right. But velocity of money from a corporate balance sheet, absolutely not. Too much weight with Dodd-Frank right now still. Cash positions on corporate balance sheets since 2000 were right here. Today, they're up here. Corporations aren't spending money. Mergers and acquisitions aren't doing a lot. Okay, so there's not a lot of velocity of money, not like there was before 08. Any other questions on anything? Yes, sir. Sorry, say again, what do I think about gold and silver? It does. It's had, a, it's had a nice run up over the years. A lot of it's been fear. Gold and silver are commodities, and they should be considered in somebody's overall portfolio. Maybe 5%, 10%, just like any other place. Large company stocks, international, cash, bonds, commodities, real estate, technology, biotech, all that stuff. Um, I'm not a big fan of the uh, uh, buying the gold coins because the dollar will collapse one day. I don't see us going back to shaving it off to go down to the store to buy a steak. I don't see that happening. But it is a good, it's a good asset class. There's a time to buy it and a time not. It's usually a, a hedge against inflation, which there isn't much. But as the dollar starts to rise, as, the, as they start to raise interest rates, and the dollar strengthens. This time around, it's going to be interesting to see what gold does. Gold's actually negative for the year, by the way. Yep, down for the year. Any other questions on anything? So I'm not against it, but there's a, there's a time to have this asset and that asset. Yes, sir. How do you figure out and, and adjust your asset allocation just simply based on the economy? If the economy is in an ex oh, period, I read all that stuff on those first few slides that I show you. I do. And then I look at technical indicators in the market as well as fundamental in the economy and try and make sure that the risk-reward relationship in the portfolios stays efficient. There's a software that, that, that talks about the efficient frontier. You know, one portfolio plots here, another one plots there, and they both have the same risk. This one's much more efficient than that one because of the returns, right? But if this one's down here with less risk, then these two could be the same because this one has more risk. So we try to keep things efficient that way. Anything else? What is our national debt? It's close to $20 trillion, isn't it? $19 trillion some dollars? Yeah, it's no big deal. Just write a check. <laughs> what I think about it, I don't think it's healthy. I think that we do not have a revenue problem in the U.S. We have a spending problem in the U.S. Um, there's enough revenue. Yeah, there you go. They need three budget columns. Touche. <laughs> That's right. 61% um, of, of our, oh, I'm going to mess this up. 61% of our spending, I just read this this morning. I can't remember it. To answer your question specifically, I'm not happy about it, but we need to have Congress sort of slow down spending. They have a, they have a, a uh, vocational incentive to spend, I should say. It is. It is. There, there's, there's just, we've got to rein it in. You know, we can rein it in, but that means if we get more revenue, it doesn't mean we spend more money. You know, what else do we need? So we've got to sort of look at the list of things. Is it important to fix, a, is it important to fix the bridge? Yes, it is. But it might not be as necessary now to build a new uh, something or other over here. Do you see what I mean? Somebody's got to go through that list. 
Yes, sir. Oh, they're throwing numbers all over the place. Yeah. So the, the question is, in your viewpoint, once a household becomes honest as to their income, their expenses, and their desires, and what their plans are with their assets, things can get squared up or fixed a little bit better economically in the household. I agree. And I'm in the position where I get to see it all with people, OK? Um, I once lost a client because I told him to sell his car, move out of his in-law's home, and get a job, OK? Um, he never came back again. But he had a 900 and some dollar a month car payment. Okay, and uh, pardon me. I don't remember what the car was. I don't know. Cause I actually went to my window in my office and looked through the window and said, "Well, where is it?" He said, "Well, it may rain today. We didn't drive it." Dude, you're 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 done. So, so I get to see what's really going on, and I get to see the reality of people really don't understand what to do. They're getting their advice from the wrong places. How can a journalist, who, how can somebody who has a degree in journalism in 300 words or less in a magazine tell me where I should manage my money? They don't know me. They don't know my income. They don't know my assets. They don't know my time frame, my risk tolerance, my taxes, nothing. How can they do that? What's the purpose? Sell a magazine, right? Now, they give good advice and stuff. But when you take that advice down to your street address, you've got to sit down, draw a line in the sand, and ask yourself the question, if I keep doing what I'm doing, where am I going to be down the road? And I've got finish lines. I've got college. I've got some sort of dependable car every several years. I've got retirement planning. I've got taxes every year. I've got to deal with utility changes, all that kind of stuff. You need to build out a financial plan. So. Spouses need to be on the same page with you. What are your goals? You know, when people come into our offices, we ask a lot of open-ended questions. You know, one, one of the questions that I ask is, three years from now, looking back at this meeting today, what, would have to, what changes would have to take place in your life financially for this new endeavor to be considered a success to you? Think about that. You know? Well, I want to get my budget straight. I want to figure out how to save. I want to figure out how to do this, that, and the other. And it all centers, sir, on a financial plan inside the family. Cash flow management. Understanding who owns the money to begin with. Tithe. Additional gifts and offerings. All that kind of stuff. So I see a lot of that. Okay, I do. And a lot of times, one spouse doesn't know what the other spouse wants as far as financial goals go. You know, I just learned that the other day. My wife told me what we're going to do with something. Okay, there you go. <laughs> you know. Um, so does that answer your question? Any other questions or anything? Okay, well, thank you all for having me. I feel so blessed to be able to come out today. I appreciate it. So thanks. Thank you, Paula. Appreciate it. Absolutely.
Oh, now it does. It, yeah, right. Okay. All right. All right. So let's, let's bow our heads. Father God, we just want to thank you for this awesome morning. Thank you, Lord God, for all the words that have been spoken. Thank you, Father God, for who you've been in our lives at this very moment. Thank you, Father God, for the speakers and, and, and those that have helped and, and even the, the, the staff, Lord, of, of the Convention Center. We just want to thank you for everybody working together in unity and on one accord. Thank you for liberty and thank you for the sound and, and thank you for everyone, Lord, that has worked together to make this morning glorious for you. And so, Lord, we ask, Father, that you would, as we break for lunch, that, Lord, that we take the word with us and that, Lord, that we meditate on it and ponder over it and talk about it and, 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 and pull out those great nuggets, dear God, that, that we all got from, uh, from everything that was spoken. Bless the food, Lord, that would nourish our bodies. Thank you for the hands that have prepared it. Thank you, Father God, for the pain and, and, and Lord, even the, the, the peculiarities and all those things, dear God, that went into preparing a great meal. So, Lord, we give you all the praise and we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.